What's up guys? Laura here with STP and welcome back to my channel where we turn stress into success. Today's video is a very special one because I am going through my top predictions for what I think is going to be on the August SAT. So if you're taking this August test, this video is perfect for you. Stick around all the way to the end because every single tip that I give you is going to be super valuable for you on test day. Now, before we begin, can we all agree that studying for the SAT is like trying to fold a fitted sheet? It's annoying, it's confusing, and it doesn't matter how long or how often you do it for, it never seems to get any easier. Before we dive in, I wanna give a huge shout out to our sponsor, Preply. Preply is the first ever digital SAT prep app that's available in the App Store and in Google Play. If you wanna do a little bit of daily SAT practice, then Preply is the perfect app for you. You can access over a thousand unique and exclusive questions right from your phone, and you can work on both English and the math on your time when it's convenient for you, wherever you want. So if this sounds like it's right up your alley, I would say go to the App Store or Google Play, download Preply today, and get that one last week of extra prep in before your test for that final push that you need. All right, guys, grab your snacks, get comfy. We're about to dive right into these predictions. Before we do, please comment below, because if you've been prepping for a while, I would love to hear what you think is gonna be on this upcoming test. Also, if you have yet to subscribe to my channel, do something amazing for yourself, smash the subscribe button and notification bell below because I come out with weekly content to help you master the SAT. All right, guys, first prediction is going to be something that compares two shapes where they don't give you any dimensions. This particular problem we're looking at right here has two similar rectangular prisms. Just as a reminder, similar means that they're in proportion to each other. So they are basically um, different sizes, but other than that, like their sides are in proportion. Um, surface area of prism A, let's actually map this out. So prism A is 64. They said the surface area of prism B is 1600. Okay, then they said the volume of prism A is 28 and they wanna know what is the volume of prism B. Now listen guys, they don't give you length, width, and height. So a lot of students get to this question and freeze. What I need you to do is think one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. Surface area is two dimensional, right? Because it's area. So when I go from 64 to 1600, that's a scalar multiple of 25. The surface area is 25 times bigger for B than it is for A. If I square root 25, that means each length is five times bigger. That's your scalar multiple. Your scalar multiple is five, okay? So if I wanna take the volume from 28 to a new volume, now I'm in three dimensional. So I'm gonna take that one dimensional scalar multiple of five, and then I'm gonna raise it to the third power to make it three dimensional. So I need to take 28 and multiply it by 125, and I believe I get 3,500. So that's how you're gonna tackle these problems. All right, my next prediction deals with trigonometry. I think there's gonna be at least one trig question on your test where they essentially want you to come up with an equation and solve. So I would recommend whenever you start, draw a picture. So they said that there's a triangle PQR. And just a heads up, if there's trig involved, cosine, sine, tangent, it's a right triangle always. Um, as you can see, they said PQ is the hypotenuse. That's another sign we know it's a right triangle. They said QR is um, 54. So I'll go ahead and label that. They wanna know what is the length of PQ? Well, if they're asking me that, that's our unknown. So I'm gonna make PQX, obviously. And then um, I noticed from all the answer choices on this problem, the reference angle is Q because see how they give you cosine Q, sine Q, they're all referencing angle Q. So I'm gonna go from angle Q. And when I look at that, I see I have adjacent over hypotenuse. So I'm dealing with cosine. So that being said, I'm gonna get rid of B and I'm gonna get rid of D. Okay, now here's how we're gonna set this up. We're gonna take the cosine of angle Q 
and then that's gonna be 54 over x. Adjacent was 54, hypotenuse, we don't know it. If I multiply both sides by x, now I have x cosine q equals 54. To solve for x, I just need to divide by cosine q on both sides. So that means the answer is 54 over cosine q, which was c. Another thing you guys should know, just real quick, quick tip, you should know the complementary angles rule. So the complementary angles rule states if A plus B equals 90 degrees, then the sine of A equals the cosine of B. So look that up guys, complementary angles rule. That's the other trig thing the SAT will test. It's been around for years now and it's still very much relevant today. I think the problem is gonna be more like the one I just did for you, but keep that in the back of your mind just in case. All right, my next prediction is they will give you a tough linear equation. This prediction I am very confident in because they've been doing it on literally every single test since they released the digital SAT. So this one says, tickets sell for 47 each for the first 25 people. After the first 25 people, any remaining tickets sell for 65 each. What is the equation that models this given n is the number of people and n is greater than 25? This is gonna be a module two question. It's gonna be higher up in number. It might be like a number 15. So it's not gonna be what it seems. You don't wanna pick an answer that has numbers directly in the problem in the answer. For instance, I'm not gonna pick something that says 65. So I would cross off C. Um, so that's just one tip. Now, it's gonna end up being a weird y-intercept that you would never expect. Let me show you how to set this thing up. You've got $47 each for the first 25 people. So that's gonna be our number uh, that's our constant. Do 47 times 25, okay? Now, we're gonna add to that um, $65 for each of the remaining people. So we're gonna do, uh, n minus 25 inside the parentheses next to the $65. Why minus 25? Because the 25, first 25 people are here, so we need to scrub them out here. If we don't take away 25 people from n, which is the total amount of people, we're gonna count the first 25 people twice. We're gonna count them paying $47 and, and then count them again paying $65, which isn't true. So that's how you set it up. Then what you're gonna do from there is you're going to um, simplify and multiply through. So you'll end up with 1175 plus 65N minus 1625. Um, that is 65N basically minus 450. So the answer is A. So just to recap, on these problems, things won't be what they seem. Don't pick answers that have numbers that are just like what the numbers are in the problem. There's gonna be a random number that shows up in the answer that you would never expect. And make sure whatever they say, if they say for the first two, whatever, subtract two from the N or the X. If they say for the first 25, you gotta subtract 25 from the total, the N or the X later, okay? That's how you're gonna set it up. All right, my next prediction deals with standard deviation. So understanding standard deviation is clutch. There aren't many statistics questions. There's about five to seven out of uh, the 44 math questions that they will ask you about, but standard deviation is a really quick, easy point if you understand it. So. This is basically all you need to know. Standard deviation gets bigger if the data is more spread out, okay? Your standard deviation will get smaller if your data is concentrated, okay? So when they say, which of the following values would decrease the standard deviation of the set below? If you picked 23, well, now that makes the data more spread out because you're putting an outlier on the end of the data. If you pick 93, same thing in the other direction. You're putting an outlier on the end of the data that spreads it out. That would increase the standard deviation. We don't want that. Pick a number that's within the data set. So as you can see, 56 is very close to the mean 
or the average of the data set, you want it in there to keep that standard deviation lower because now the data is less spread out and that's why the answer is B. Okay, one thing I want you guys to keep in mind is you will never have to crunch numbers with standard deviation. You do not need to whip out your calculator. You do not need to use your list function on your calculator and enter a bunch of data points. That takes too long. Just look at the data, high level conceptual problem. You'll be able to answer it in like 10 or 15 seconds. All right, my next prediction deals with understanding function notation and exponent rules. This could be one or the other on the test or it could be both. A big um, trend I've seen on the digital SAT is you understanding function notation. So just a heads up, like if you saw f of two equals five, you need to know two is x, five is y. You need to know f of two, the whole thing is y, okay? So that's super important. Um, you also need to understand f of two equals five is another way of basically writing the set of coordinates two comma five. So that means the point two comma five is on the function f. So when they give you a question like this, where they give you an equation and then they tell you f of five equals 16 times f of three, you wanna take that function notation and basically replicate it and rewrite it as the equation. So again, f of five, that means x is five. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite f of five as c to the fifth because that's our function f. So see how I'm putting five into x's spot? Then I'm going to write the other side. So I'm gonna have 16 times c to the third. Okay, now we're dealing with an, basically an exponent rules problem. Now, I know exponent rules when you multiply, you add. So c to the fifth equals c squared times c cubed. So that means that 16 equals c squared. So I'm gonna solve for c. So when I square root it, that means C is four. Okay, the next one that I have as a prediction is interpreting an exponential growth equation, which um, some of these are becoming much more challenging than they used to be. So just to break things down so you understand this equation first, the 36 is basically your initial amount, okay? The um, 0.24, that's your rate. So it's, it's basically a growth because it's greater than one in the parentheses of 24%. And then this out here, your exponent, that's basically your time. Usually time is in years. So it looks like we would have one iteration um, every uh, five years on this case. So let's go ahead and we're gonna read this question though because this gets much more detailed than that and we actually do have to crunch some numbers here. By the way, after I do this one, comment below if you have an easier way because my way, I, you kinda have to grind it out. So if you have a shortcut, I would love to hear it. So we have for the given function f, the value of f of x increases by p percent for every increase of x by 10. What is the value of p? Well, if you have a problem that talks about increasing by P percent, what you need to do is you need to start with a baseline and then you need to do the increase to find the percent change. So I would recommend starting with X is zero. That's such an easy baseline to start with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically put X equals zero into the problem and then see what I get. Now anything to the zero power is one, so that's essentially 36 times one, which is 36. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make x 10, because they said for every increase of x by 10, so going from zero to 10 does increase x by 10. So I'm gonna put 10 into the problem and see what I get. Now what happens is 10 to the fifth um, simplifies to squared. So I basically do 36 um, times 1.24 squared. Okay, I got 55.35. So here's our original amount. And then here's our new amount. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna employ the percent change formula. The percent change formula basically is the new minus the original over the original times 100. So I'm gonna go 55.35 
minus 36 over 36 times 100. So I get 19.35 over 36 times 100. So I get 0.5375 times 100, which is about 54%. Now, the SAT will probably ask you to round. They'll say round to the nearest tenth, round to the nearest whole number. Whenever you get an answer, always go back to the question and read it again. Make sure you're answering what they ask for, um, you're answering it appropriately. They might give you multiple choice answers. That's a little bit easier to suss out the right one. But if you have to enter an answer, after doing all that good work and knowing how to do the question, Please do not mess it up by not filling in the answer correctly. All right, my next prediction deals with probability with given statements. This is something that's been trending for some time now. They basically took a probability question, which honestly is pretty simple in my opinion, and they made it a little bit more challenging with a twist. So as you can see, we have a table here and it says one of the participants is selected at random from the group. What is the probability that the participant will be from group A, given that the participant is younger than 20? Okay, when you see a given statement, like bells should be going off, like, oh no, like this isn't just a normal probability problem. I cannot take the total of 105 and put it on the bottom. The participant has to be younger than 20. So when you have a given statement, you're probably gonna have to take away one, or more groups, okay? So they have to be younger than 20. We are taking away that entire 20 plus year group and we're just gonna work with what's left. Now, what you need to recognize is you have a new total. Your new total is only out of 70, not out of 105. So that's what we're gonna put on the bottom. And then you need group A. Well, you have a new total of group A too because we're not counting the 20 year olds. So the total of group A's is going to be 24. That'll go on the top. Can you fit 24 70ths in? Yes, you can. You have five spaces. So you could do 24 slash 70, but please do not do that. Always reduce your fractions. So you could divide both by two to reduce it down. What I would even recommend is just converting it to a decimal to be extra safe. So I would probably enter in um, 0.3429. Here's one space, two, three, four, five, and then we're done. But that's how you're gonna tackle a probability given statement. All right, my next prediction deals with tricky absolute value problems. Again, this digital SAT on module two, they're taking very basic concepts with a twist. And it's a bigger twist that um, is more abstract a lot of times, so it's harder to wrap your head around. But let's just stick with the basics. If they say seven absolute value X minus four equals K, well, obviously first we're gonna divide both sides by seven. So that means the absolute value of X minus four equals K over seven. They wanna know what could be the value of that. Great, so we're already at that point where we have K over seven. Now the big thing that they said to us in this problem is that it has exactly one solution. Well, just a heads up, if you think about it graphically, I think that that's always helpful. An absolute value graph looks like a V. So for it to have one solution, it might look something like this, where it just touches the X axis at that one point. Um, so it's not gonna have two. Now, when you think about solving an absolute value, what you do is you basically take away the absolute values, you set one equal to the positive result or whatever the original result was, which is K over seven. Then you set one equal to the negative result. So you negate K over seven. Here's the thing though, if there's only one solution, you have to think about this logically. That means this equals that. Cause if they were different, you would get two different results for X. What's the only way you could get K over seven to equal negative K over seven. The only way is if K is zero because then zero will equal zero, and that's why the answer is C. So just be ready for that. That might come up on your test, and I've seen it trending. All right, my next prediction deals with weighted means. I think you guys are gonna have a word problem on your test. 
that talks about um, the, the mean of a certain set being this, the mean of another set being that, and then you've got to figure out a new mean or something. So let me give you an example with this problem. It says a nutritionist is investigating the calorie content of 200 different food items by measuring the calories of each item. The mean calorie content of all 200 food items is 250 calories. The nutritionist classifies each of these food items as either low calorie or high calorie. Of the 200 food items, 60 items were classified as low calorie, and these 60 items have a mean calorie content of 150 calories. The remaining 140 items were classified as high calorie. What is the mean calorie content and calories of the 140 items classified as high calorie food items? I think I want to take a nap. I don't know. I, this word problem is a lot and that was a little exhausting reading that. But let's just talk about how there's a total of 200 food items, okay? So um, they said there were 60 low calorie and they had a mean calorie content of 150. Now here's the thing. If we have 60 items and the mean content is 150 calories, we're just gonna weight each of those 60 items at 150 calories. So I'm gonna do 60 times 150. Why do I have to do it that way? Well, I don't know what each item is individually. One might be 148 calories. Another one might be 171 calories. We have no way of knowing what each individual item is. So we just go off the assumption that all 60 items are exactly 150 calories because that's what they average out to anyways. So I'm going to weight the 60 food items at 150 calories. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to um, add in 140 food items. We don't know how much calories that is. That's what they want to know. So then I'm going to set this equal to um, the mean calorie content for all of them was 250. Well, how do we get mean, right? We have to divide by the total amount there are. Okay, so at this point, I'm basically finding the average of all of those food items calories and then the, it should equal out to 250. I'm going to solve for X to find out what the other 140 items need to be for that to happen. So I'll multiply both sides by 200. Okay, I get 50,000. And then I'm going to do 60 times 150. I get 9,000. So I have basically 9,000 plus 140X equals 50,000. I'm gonna take away the 9,000. So now I have 140X equals 41,000. We'll divide by 140. X equals 292.86. So again, on the SAT, they will either give you multiple choice options, so you can pick the closest. They will ask you to round, make sure you round to the appropriate spot. Um, basically, if I was to fill this in, I would have to fill this in as 292.9. So they would probably ask me to round to the nearest tenth because that's five spots and that's all we can fill in. But take a step back and ask yourself, does that make sense? If a low calorie item is 150 calories, would it make sense for a high calorie item to be almost 300? Sure, that's believable. If I got an answer that said like 4,000, then I would probably question that and go back to the drawing board. So always make sure your answer makes sense when you're done. If you're finding this video helpful so far, show me some love, hit the like button below. All right, my last prediction deals with questions that talk about displaying constants or coefficients in the equation, okay? So traditionally on the paper tests and even earlier on on the digital SAT, um, they would ask questions like the following that I put as the first example. Which of the following equations displays as constants or coefficients the coordinates of the vertex? This is basically SAT speak that basically says um, which equation can you look at and know the vertex? So basically, without doing any number crunching, without doing any math, can you see the coordinates of the vertex right in the equation? 
And on this one, you know, A shows the solutions. We have a solution at negative two and five. B is nothing, that's not even a quadratic, it's a linear. C shows the y-intercept, the y-intercept is at negative seven. D is the one that shows the coordinates of the vertex. We know the vertex is at negative two, negative seven from that number and that number because it's in vertex form. So what they're doing now is they're doing that, but they're doing it with exponential equations. So let's take a look at this example. It says for the exponential function f, the value of f of one is m, where m is a constant. Which of the following equivalent forms of the function f show the value of m as a coefficient or the base? Okay. So we're gonna use this, f of one is m, okay? Remember guys, from function notation, the one is your x value. So if I put one in for x into c, I get this magical number up here in the exponent, which is zero. And that's what I want, because what that means is, um, 152 times 1 1.5 to the zero gets me 152 times one, which gets me 152. Ooh, my bad. <laughs> gets me 152. 152 is a number I can already clearly see in the problem. So if 152 is M, because they said when X is one, you get M, M is something that is a coefficient or the base. Basically, it's displayed already in the problem. So that's why we're gonna pick C. All right, guys, and there you have it. Those are my top predictions for the August SAT. I hope this video helps you feel a little bit more prepared and a little less stressed. Remember, it's all about working smarter, not harder. Big thanks to the Preply app for making this video possible. Don't forget to download it and get those extra reps in. Having the Preply app is like having a personal tutor right in your pocket, minus the awkward small talk. If you found this video helpful, make sure to share it with your friends. And drop a comment below with any questions that you have for me. I love hearing from you guys. All right, time to hit the books or the app. So until next time, guys, stay cool, stay confident. I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.